Jesus is a uh, person that existed that continues to enrich the lives of people every day. Jesus is God's son, and he was sent to save our sins. I think he is a pretty cool guy. He had a, a peaceful philosophy. I think he's misinterpreted by a lot of people. He's the savior of this world. I don't know, because I don't really believe in him, so I don't really think anything of him. I, I mean, he could have been a real person. I mean, I'm sure he was. I mean, I'm sure he was just, you know, good at what he did or something. I feel that Jesus is a modern-day scapegoat. Jesus is God, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just learned that. Uh, Jesus was a man, from what I figure. Who is Jesus? He was a dude. Lived back in the day. Pretty awesome. He had a beard. He was just kind of a guy with a really unique, positive message as that kind of gave a lot of people a lot of hope. He probably existed, but I don't believe that he was the son of God. Or anything. He died on the cross for us and uh, saved us and rose again from the dead. I want to sound smart, but... <laughs>a journey through the gospel of john where each week as the lord leads we're declaring different aspects of who he is so that should we be asked on the street who is jesus we'll be able to say something with meaning content and conviction and persuasion how many would like to be able to do that all right john chapter 12 verse 20 says now there were certain greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast the date is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of the Passover festival, which lasts about a week. And verse 21, these Greeks came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And then Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Now, Andrew's the guy that was always bringing people to meet Jesus. What I love about this text is what the Pharisees had just said. Verse 19, they had said among themselves, you see, you're accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. They're highly incensed because there has been a parade coming down the Mount of Olives with Jesus riding on a donkey's colt and a mother a donkey nearby and people waving branches of trees, throwing them down on the ground, laying their outer garments down for the donkey to walk on. And then Jesus receives all this praise, then he goes to the temple and cleanses it, runs out all the money-making ventures that are happening there that were taking up space in the court that was designed for Gentiles to come and observe the people of God in their worship. Then he began to heal the blind and the lame. And so they were esteemed. They said the whole world has gone after him. The next verse, John just happens to mention two Greeks who weren't from that part of the world looking for Jesus. So what I like about these Pharisees is when they get upset and angry, some things they say actually become prophetic. The previous chapter, one of the lead high priests said, it's not good that the nation die for one man. It's better that one man die for the whole nation. They believed that Jesus was going to destroy their nation, so let's destroy him so the nation isn't destroyed. Well, that was a prophetic statement. Jesus died for the whole nation because the nation was going to be destroyed. Rome was going to come in and level that place, but it wasn't going to be because of Jesus. He provided a way out. He gave them a warning. If you read Matthew 24, said he tells them, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out of town. And church history says when in 70 AD, when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem and set up a siege, the Christians were all gone. Not one Christian died in that venture. So it's important to heed the Lord's warning when he gives them. Amen. So Philip and Andrew go and tell Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He said in verse 23, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, we think, oh, great, he's going to be glorified. But the path to glory must lead through some gory stuff. You know, we live for the Lord from glory to glory, but sometimes between those glories can be some gory stuff. There's the principle they call the peak to peaks principle. From one mountaintop to the next mountaintop are valleys to go through, to journey through. Because God declares the end to already be at the very beginning, Christ is calling his crucifixion, his glorification. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. 
He went through the mess for the sake of the message. He went through the test for the sake of the testimony. So the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. It's time. It's time. It's on. And so he begins to do things that actually pushes the accelerator on his enemies to try to do away with him. Verse 24, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now, in the realm of agriculture, you understand you can keep a seed for years and it won't produce fruit. But you throw it into the ground, which will make the seed wet, make the seed moist, life springs forth, the seed no longer exists. I believe in one of the pyramids they found a container of seeds that was centuries old. I think it was wheat seeds. They planted it and it grew. So it's in death, the dying of the seed, burying of the seed, that brings life from the seed. And so Christ is calling himself the seed. Now we know according to Genesis 3.16, God told the serpent that he would put enmity between him and the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman would bruise his head and he would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Christ is that seed. He had an earthly mother, not an earthly father. He had an earthly grandfather, obviously, Mary's dad, and earthly forefather in Abraham and Noah and Adam. But he was a seed, singular, of a woman. And through being crucified, he removed the death sentence that Satan lorded over humanity with, so now we no longer have to be afraid of dying. It's simply exiting one dimension, entering another. And in being crucified... He was bruised all over, but he was especially bruised on one of his heels, singular, hanging on three nails, one foot on top of the other one, all the weight of his body on those three nails and one heel. Prophetic picture of the seed dying to bring life to us and victory over the enemy. Verse 25, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So there's got to be a point in our life where we grow spiritually where we don't love the world, but we love the Lord and we're willing to die for him. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. All of these men who are hearing him speak, the 12, were going to be tortured. The 11, that is, were going to be tortured. And all of them but one would be killed for their faith. They were following Jesus. And guess what? They're honored by the Father. Verse 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And the Father glorified his name when he raised him from the dead, right? But look at what the Father says. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. God who sees the end from the beginning, he's the Alpha and Omega, he's the first and the last, glorified Jesus from the foundation of the world and will glorify him at his resurrection. Jesus answered and said, verse 30, This voice did not come because of me, But for your sake, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Now is the judgment of this world. His experience on the cross was judgment day where he was going to be judged for the sins of the world. Now, I know, you know, we live in a very anti-judging culture. And I know it's important that we not make judgments in areas where we do not have authority. Right? Your child acts up. Your neighbor's not supposed to come discipline your child. It's your responsibility. It's in your sphere of authority to make a judgment call as to what to do. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine meaning you've got to make a judgment call as to what you do with your pearls or those things that are precious to you, right? But judgment isn't all negative. Judgment can be a positive thing. 
If you have a legitimate diamond and you bring it to a legitimate jeweler and he judges that diamond, it's going to be a good thing. He's going to put his name, his stamp of approval that you have a legitimate diamond. That is judgment. And so through Christ receiving the negative judgment for sin, when he declared it is finished, it's as though he declared the debt has been paid in full. How many like to get a bill in the mail with a red stamp on it that says paid in full? Bam! That's a judgment call that we like. Amen? So the world was judged. And Christ paid that price, ultimate price, so that the world wouldn't have to be judged. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that the world through him might be saved. So the freedom from the condemnation or the judgment that was upon us is wrought through his being judged. He became sin without sinning, taking our place on the cross, dying as our substitute, coming down so that we can go up, coming out so that we can go in, becoming naked so that we can be clothed, becoming poor so that we can be made rich, becoming sick so that we can be made whole, becoming in prison so that we can be set free. He did that for us as our substitute. So he says, now it is the judgment of this world. That was four days later when it actually happened, but he declares it now. He's God who declares the end from the beginning. It is finished. He calls those things which be not as though they were till they become. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So on the cross, he disarmed the enemy. Had his heel bruised in the process, but the enemy's headship was damaged. He was overcome. What looks like a curse on the cross looks like all hell broke loose to the enemy's camp. Now, no longer does he have any authority to torment us with the fear of death. Many times in the last 20 plus years, As a pastor, we've prayed with people that are being tormented with nightmares and God sets them free. Why? Because the enemy has no right to torment us anymore. He was judged on the cross. His authority was taken away. We had sold ourselves out to sin through our forefather, Adam. We were separated from God and from one another. And Jesus hung. He was hung up for our hang-ups. Hung between heaven and earth. Bridged the gap. Fixed the short in the circuit so that through his death we might receive life as our substitute. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. Now it looks like he's ignoring what Philip and Andrew told him about the Greek that wanted to see him. I don't think so. Because what he was going to do was be lifted up on the cross and die for the sins of the world, so that not only could Jews know him, but Greeks and all kinds of people could know him. By being drawn to himself. This he said, verse 33, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, quote, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. The Messiah is eternal. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Now, verse 32, Jesus said, If I am lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So why do these listeners say he says, son of man? Well, in John chapter 3, he had spoken to Nicodemus and said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the Old Testament is a story of God's people being affected with snake bites that were fatal. And Moses prayed for them, and God told him what to do. He said, you make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and whoever looks at that serpent will be healed of their snake bite. Strange story. God used it, and it worked. Centuries later, that that brazen serpent had to be destroyed because it had become an idol. But it was a tool that God used to teach a lesson. Because one day his son would come and would die on the cross. He would be hung up so that whoever would look to that act in faith could be healed from the snake bite of sin. His death on the cross was a judgment of Satan. Brass is symbolic of judgment. When you were judged by God, the heavens were brass. Your prayers were not heard. The judgment seat of Christ, his feet are as brass. So brass is symbolic of judgment. And so the judgment of sin, which is what 
the enemy had us bound by was dealt with on the cross so that we can look towards him. So you see, even though in John 12, he didn't say, if the Son of Man is lifted up, he said, if I am lifted up, he had said Son of Man in reference to his being lifted up. You see that? In John 8, 28, he said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. So he had been speaking of his being lifted up, of his being crucified, as a son of man. So they weren't putting words in his mouth. I'd like to speak to you this morning on the subject, Jesus is the son of man. Can we say that? Jesus is the son of man. What does this term mean, the son of man? He used this name for himself more than any other. He declared himself to be the son of God, himself to be the Messiah. But more times than those times, Like 83 times in the Gospels, he calls himself the Son of Man. I believe it directly connects him to a prophecy in Daniel 7 that we'll look at in a few minutes. But I think it also connects him to us, to mankind, because he was God who became man. He was always God. He wasn't always man. He became man, died for our sins, and rose from the dead as man. And now he will always be a man, just like us. We'll be people, men and women in heaven, be known as we are known for eternity. So he will too. So in that sense, he had a beginning, that is, in becoming the son of man. The son of man is the son of Adam, or the descendant of Adam, the descendant of Abraham. As a human being, he declares himself to be one of us. Paul wrote in Philippians that he made himself lower than the angels and became one of us and humbled himself and came as a servant lower than us and even humbled himself lower than that, died a death of a criminal. He's the son of man. So it's a term of humility. It also identifies himself with being the prophet. As there was a prophecy that came that God would send a prophet after his heart. And Christ was that prophet. And more than once they asked him, are you the prophet? So in calling himself son of man, he was connecting himself to the prophets of the Old Testament. Ezekiel was called by God dozens of times son of man. Son of man, son of man. This seems to be Jesus' favorite designation of himself. And it appears mostly in the Gospels. In the fourth Gospel, he calls himself son of man 13 times. And most of these times it's associated with his crucifixion and suffering and his revelation but it especially takes on significance when you connect it with Daniel chapter 7, which we'll look at in a few minutes. Who is this Son of Man? He is the gateway to heaven. Can we say that? He is the gateway to heaven. In John 1, when he met Nathanael and told him, I saw you when you were under the fig tree, it blew Nathanael's mind. And Jesus basically said, basically said, you think that's a big deal. That's nothing. Here's what's going to happen. Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He was living as a man, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and angels would come to him and bring words telling him, hey, go to the pool and heal that crippled guy that I'm going to show you. So God would use angels even in strengthening Jesus when he was physically weak. And Nathaniel was going to witness these things. And here Christ is identifying with our humanity by calling himself the Son of Man. He is our spiritual food. Can we say that? He is our spiritual food. In John 6, 27, Jesus said, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which a son of man will give you because the Father has set his seal on him. He gives food for life, but literally he is the food for life. He gave his body and his blood as our solution to everything. And we celebrate that when we partake of the Lord's table. We celebrate his shed blood and his broken body through the bread and the cup. He did that as a son of man. He could not give himself 
die, shed his blood, and be broken as a son of God. He's eternal. But by also being the son of man, he's our sacrifice. And we're to draw as near to him and be as open to him as we are to good food. You know, if you don't believe that McDonald's serves healthy food, you won't eat there. If you don't believe one of the businesses on the square has food that is clean of defects, you won't want to eat there. So it is with Christ. If you don't believe in him, you can't partake of him. Number three, who is the son of man? He is glorified. He is glorified. The hour has come, he said, that the Son of Man should be glorified. The next chapter, verse 31, he, when he had gone out, when Judas left to go betray him, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If you don't remember anything, remember this. In facing the cross, the most unbelievable torture, Jesus calls it glorification. Not that the cross was glorious, but the outcome of it was glorious. Right? He calls those things which be not as though they were. He calls those things which do not exist as though they already did. He looks past the pain. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. It wasn't a joy ride for him, but he looked past to the glory that was coming. If you're a parent and you're discouraged with where your kids are right now, look past their teen years. <laughs> Better days are coming. Don't curse them. Don't speak ill of their future. Don't do that. Speak positive towards the glory that's coming. There's a lesson there. Number four, who is the Son of Man? This Son of Man he is lifted up. John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In the next verse is verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. Verse 28 of John 8, he said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. He is lifted up. Number five, He is King of an eternal kingdom. I believe this is really what He's referring to when He calls Himself Son of Man. Those Pharisees who knew the Scriptures, it would irritate them to no end. Daniel said, In verse 13 of chapter 7 of his book, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So this is the Son of Man coming before the Father. See that? The Ancient of Days, the Son of Man coming before the Father. Verse 14, Then to him was given dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. His kingdom is unending. His kingdom will never die. As believers, we have a citizenship in that kingdom through our new birth. When we are born again, we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear son. I have a niece that was born in Africa, but because her parents were Americans, being my sister and brother-in-law, she was born an American. Now, there was some paperwork to fill out, but it was just to make it official. It wasn't to make her American. She was already American, even though she was born overseas. She has all the rights and privileges as an American, except she could never run for president. 
She wasn't born in American territory. When you were born again, you were made a citizen of heaven, even though you've never been there. And you have all the rights and privileges of a citizen of heaven. You are an ambassador. An ambassador is an official of the highest order representing one kingdom or one nation in the presence of another. You and I have dual citizenships if we're Americans. If we're believers, we're citizens of heaven and we're citizens of this nation. May we keep our priorities right and realize we are representing heaven on the earth. And if we ever go overseas and get mistreated, may we never stomp our feet and say, but I'm an American. No, we're representing heaven. It doesn't impress people in other nations anyway when we do that. And we're part of a kingdom that will not be destroyed. Our prayer is, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Earth is not the kingdom, but the kingdom is coming. The church is the agency of that kingdom. But the earth is not the kingdom. The earth is groaning for that kingdom to be fully manifested. The Holy Spirit is groaning. The older I get, the more my body is groaning. This is from World Magazine, just some of the horrible stuff that happened last year. Would you like to hear what happened last January? Twelve months ago, January 8th, the Department of Agriculture declared 597 counties and 14 states to be disaster areas due to an ongoing drought. Who remembers when we used to have a lake? January 15th, food inspectors discover horse meat in meatballs at Ikea. January 15th, two explosions rock a university in Syria, killing more than 80 students. January 16th, Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists attack and take control of a natural gas field in southern Algeria. At least 37 civilians die during the four-day siege. That's just one month. Every month, page after page, it's just unbelievable stuff that happened last year. Why are we here? We are here to represent the Son of Man. As citizens of His kingdom. That's why we're here. This was Christ's first coming. And He rode to His glorification on a borrowed donkey. This is His second coming. He's coming back with many crowns on his head on a white horse that is his. Who is the Son of Man? He is the gateway to heaven. He is our spiritual food. He is glorified. He is lifted up. He is king of an eternal kingdom. And finally, he is the last Adam. The first Adam messed us up. The last Adam fixed us up. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19 through 23 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21. For since by man, that is Adam, came death, by man, that is the Son of Man, also came the resurrection of the dead. Adam brought death. Last Adam brought life. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, who is the Son of Man, all should be made alive. And verse 45, and so it is written, the first Adam became a living being, and then when he sinned, he became a dying being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. He arose from the dead, he ascended to the Father, and he sent the Holy Spirit to us. To bring us life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the good news. The revelation of who you are. I thank you, Lord, that you became one of us. You became (laughs) our ticket to heaven. You became all that we needed. And you did that for us. Lord, may we live in light of the glory 
and always be thankful that you went through the glory to purchase the glory for us. In Jesus' name.